Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, how many combinations of symptoms can result in a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD? Now, this was a question submitted by a subscriber, and it's a clever question. It gets at one of the problems we see with the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder, meaning that individuals who are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder are heterogeneous in terms of symptom presentation because post-traumatic stress disorder is not specific. There are too many combinations of symptoms that result in a diagnosis. Now, some mental health disorders, we don't see this as a problem because they're more specific. The individuals who have those disorders are part of an homogenous population, so they're more alike in terms of the presentation of mental health symptoms. So I looked at the definition for PTSD, specifically the symptom criteria. And right away, I excluded the category of trauma because somebody has to have a trauma to be considered for post-traumatic stress disorder. And that particular category isn't really problematic in terms of the definition. And instead, I looked at all the other categories and performed my analysis, performed my calculations from there. Before I explain those calculations, I'm going to offer a simple example of how this works to determine how many combinations. Let's say there was a mental health disorder that only had three symptom criteria, A, B, and C. And to qualify for diagnosis of that mental health disorder, you had to meet two of the three, at least two of the three symptom criteria. So the calculation here is fairly straightforward. This is combination without replacement. So again, you have three symptom criteria, A, B, and C. You need two, at least two, to qualify for a diagnosis. That means you could have A and B. B and C, A and C, or A, B and C, and qualify for a diagnosis. Again, combination without replacement. So you have three from the one category, that's two symptom criteria met, and one for the second, which of course is all of them. You can only meet A, B and C in one way, and that's to have all three symptoms. So I end up with four possible classifications, four possible presentations of that mental health disorder. Now, when we talk about PTSD, it becomes much more complex. You have that trauma category, and again, I'm not gonna use that, but then you have other categories, and each of the categories have their own number of symptom criteria and differing numbers of how many symptoms are required. Some have one, some have two. So it becomes still combination without replacement but you have to calculate the combinations for each category and then multiply them together because there's combinations between the categories as well. So I performed that calculation and came up with a number and then did some research and I found a paper written in 2013 by Galatzer and Bryant in which they answered the same question. And we both came up with the same number of possible PTSD presentations because we use the same mathematical technique, combination without replacement. And that number is 636,120 possible presentations of PTSD. Now the fact that those researchers and I came up with the same result in terms of the mathematics really isn't that amazing because there is only one technically correct way to perform this calculation. What I found more interesting is that we both decided to exclude trauma. In order to have a diagnosis of PTSD, there had to have been some sort of traumatic event. So it seems logical to exclude this category and use the other categories in the calculations. Also, when you think of how PTSD can really identify a heterogeneous group, meaning there can be a lot of differences between individuals with PTSD, the trauma category really isn't problematic here. Again, we know people are going to experience different traumas and they're going to be assessed for PTSD. What's problematic is that we have these other categories that result in this heterogeneous population instead of, as is the case with some mental health disorders, where they're more specific and they're identifying a homogenous population. Ideally, classifications for mental health disorders would be specific enough so we can consider the population homogenous in that respect. So you may be wondering why combination without replacement 
is the way to go for this calculation and not combination with replacement. And I can demonstrate this fairly quickly. Going back to that example with A, B, and C, the three symptom criteria, if you were to use combination with replacement, that means that one symptom, say symptom A, could be used more than once for somebody to qualify for a mental health disorder. And of course, that's not the way we diagnose. Using PTSD and flashbacks, for example, we wouldn't say that somebody met the criterion for flashbacks more than one time. Once it's met, it's taken out of the calculation. So that's why we would not use combination with replacement, and instead we would use combination without replacement. So I'll describe this methodology that I use to calculate the number of possible PTSD types, number of possible presentations. It's the same method used in the article that I mentioned. And it's a little bit complex. I'm not really going to cover it completely, the methodology part completely here. But I did make a separate video where I show you how to perform this calculation in Excel. If you're interested in the mathematical details of it, I will have that video posted as well. So the brief description of this methodology really involves the four categories of PTSD other than trauma. So really we're just talking about the other four categories, intrusion, avoidance, negative alterations of cognitions and mood, I'll just refer to that as negative mood, and arousal. So there's these four categories and there's so many symptoms in each category. So with intrusion, there's five symptom criteria. An individual needs to meet one of those five. For avoidance, there are two. An individual needs to have at least one of those. Negative mood, there are seven, but the minimum number of symptoms is two. So at least two out of seven. And for arousal, it's two out of six. And again, you have to meet at least those minimums in each of those categories for the diagnosis. So one of those categories can't be missing altogether. So here's how the math breaks down. First, we have to look at each category individually. So I'm just gonna use intrusion as an example. And as I mentioned, if you want more detail, you can look at the video with the Excel spreadsheet. So with intrusion, you have a minimum of one symptom of the five symptom criteria. So we don't even really need the equation to figure out the combinations there, there's five possibilities. You can have symptom one, symptom two, three, four, or five. So with the one out of five, you have five possibilities. Now, you could also have two out of five. That would also make somebody eligible for that category in that diagnosis. And for there, we'd use the equation to calculate combinations, and we come up with 10 possible combinations. Three out of five works out the same. That's another 10. Four out of five, there's five combinations for that. And of course, five out of five, there's only one way to do that. So that gives us five, 10, 10, five, and one, which is 31. So there's 31 possible ways to meet just that intrusion category of post-traumatic stress disorder. I did the same for the remaining categories, avoidance, negative mood, and arousal. For avoidance, we get three possible categories. That one's easy because there's only two symptom criteria. So you either meet one, the other, or both. So it's three. There's 120 different combinations for negative mood and 57 for arousal. So you have to multiply all these combinations together to get the total number of potential definitions, the total number of potential presentations of post-traumatic stress disorder under the DSM definition. When you multiply those together, you get 636,120. Now, I think the mathematics of this is fascinating, and it's certainly a type of mathematical principle we apply, as I mentioned, other areas of mental health treatment. But what does it mean? Why does it matter that PTSD can be defined in so many different ways? Well, the problem with a classification that's so heterogeneous is again, it doesn't really tell us anything about that individual. A classification of mental health disorder should tell us something about an individual that we'd expect to be fairly similar in another individual. Of course, all individuals are different, 
but that classification is there to narrow things down a bit. Going back to that example of a classification where you only have four possible combinations, that narrows it down a bit. Someone with that mental health disorder would have just one of four possible presentations. So we have more information, it's more specific. When there's 636,120 different combinations, that really doesn't tell us a lot about the individual who has post-traumatic stress disorder. So what I'm getting at here is that the classification itself of post-traumatic stress disorder might not be so useful. Now, of course, this definition of post-traumatic stress disorder is the one that we have. And just because there are a lot of different potential presentations, a lot of different combinations, doesn't mean that it's useless. It's an important diagnosis, and it does inform treatment. But what do we do about this heterogeneous nature of PTSD? How do we move it to a more homogeneous nature? Well, changing the definition of PTSD is one potential solution, but there aren't a lot of great ideas about how to do that, in my opinion. The definition we have now does tend to work, even though it is particularly complex with all these different combinations. Probably the solution to this issue, if you want to think of it as an issue that needs a solution, is that clinicians really provide an individual assessment and they base the treatment on the presentation of that individual, not necessarily post-traumatic stress disorder treatment in general, but specific treatment for that individual. Yes, the treatment would have to work for post-traumatic stress disorder in general, but the treatment needs to be tailored so it's specific to that individual presentation. Again, we know that there's over 600,000 potential presentations just in the definition, and each individual is an individual. They're going to present differently anyway. So that number, the 636,120, doesn't speak to the individual nature fully because, as I mentioned, people are individuals. And you can look at issues like severity and type, and you could make that number even much larger. So the problem may seem complex, but actually it's even more complex than it seems. So consider for intrusive memories, for example. Well, how severe is that intrusion? How often? How long does it last? So frequency, duration, and severity. All these would increase the number of combinations even more into many millions. So really, I think the best strategy is to look at everybody like an individual and plan the treatment based on that particular presentation while being informed at the same time by the literature that we have on post-traumatic stress disorder and the different treatments that we know could be effective for that disorder. So as I mentioned, if you're interested in the specific calculations I performed to come up with the number of combinations, I have that other video where I go through it in Excel. Also, if there's any other disorders that you may be interested in terms of how many combinations there are, or if you have an alternate methodology, if you have a different way of looking at how to calculate the number of combinations for PTSD or any other mental health disorder, looking at some of those other factors like I mentioned, like frequency, duration, severity, I'd be interested to see those comments. Again, as I mentioned, I think that there's only one technically correct methodology, but that's strictly looking at the mathematics, not looking at the variation for any particular symptom criterion. So there are a large number of solutions to this conceptual problem of how many different presentations do we have for a mental health disorder. I hope you found this discussion of PTSD and the number of presentations of PTSD to be interesting. Thanks for watching.